It's not rocket science, it's social science. Okay, so over the course of this unit, we've looked at a variety of things with these, uh, these ideas of the human sciences. Today we're going to wrap up. I'm going to take one more look at the difference between and the relationship between the natural sciences and the human sciences, okay? So some call them hard and soft, right? That you have these hard sciences, your physics, your chemistry, your bio, and then these soft social sciences, the, the um, sociology, anthropology, psych psychology, okay? The fact is that human beings do have a bit of a prejudice there, okay? When we think of the so-called soft sciences, we don't tend to give them the high regard that we often give the hard sciences, especially when we put the word science with it. The, it seems like they don't have the same kind of explanatory power of like biology and physics have that sort of real scientific power there. But that doesn't mean that human scientists aren't applying the aspects of science to their work. They are. It's just a little trickier when dealing with humans. Okay? So there's no doubt that these studies are important, that we need to study economics, we need to study psychology, but there's still this sort of skepticism that they're not really doing real science. Like the real science is being done by the hard sciences people. Okay? And I'm not sure if there's any way to really overcome that sort of prejudice there because of the nature of what's being studied. Okay? What Bertrand Russell said was that the fundamental concept in social science is power and the same sense in which energy is the fundamental concept in physics. For those of you who don't know Bertrand Russell, he was a mathematician and a philosopher. Right? So is that what are we talking about kind of a similar aspect here? So I'm going to introduce the first view of this, the view known as reductionism, okay? or re reduction to reduce something. Okay, so in reductionism, what you have is this ability to reduce something down. So let's say one of you was suffering from schizophrenia, okay? You could look at that, and if someone was suffering from schizophrenia, we could send them to a psychologist, and maybe they could work on that and develop some techniques to help them overcome their schizophrenia. But as well... Biologists and neuroscientists right now are doing a lot of studies of the human brain. Maybe neuroscientists will get so good at studying the human brain that they can treat uh, schizophrenia from a neuroscientist perspective, and maybe they can treat other psychological things. And so then what I'm saying is maybe we don't need psychologists. Maybe we can just have neuroscientists do the work that psychologists do so they could use their neuroscience to study the brain. But wait a minute. Neuroscientists of the brain, the brain is really a bunch of chemicals. Mr. Weed, please what if we did advances in chemistry that actually solved some of the problems of neuroscience? So maybe biology could just be chemistry studies. Maybe we just need chemistry. If we're really, really good at chemistry, maybe then we don't need neuroscience and biology, and therefore we don't need psychology. But wait, let's go one more step up. How does chemistry work? Chemistry works by atoms bonding with other atoms, and the motion of atoms is in the realm of physics. So maybe Mr. Libby is right. Maybe it is all about physics. That's the reductionist position. The reductionist essentially says, that we can reduce things. So maybe if we want to study whether or not, why are prices rising in this particular market, which is something that you'd normally think of in economics, maybe we should study the psychology of the people who are buying those products. And in order to study the psychology, like we just said, maybe we should be studying neuroscience, and maybe instead of studying neuroscience, we can study physics. But now here's the question. Is the reductionist position correct? If we do as much study of physics as possible, can we figure out why the price of a certain item is the way it is? That's the flaw of the reductionist position is we tend to reduce things down. We go, okay, well, to study economics, I should study psychology. To study psychology, I should study biology. And really, I should just study physics because physics relates to all those other ones. Okay? In some ways, the reductionist position is useful. Like, for example... To reduce thermodynamics down to mechanics 
is useful because it helps scientists explain heat in terms of the motion of molecules. So there, reductionism was a useful thing to reduce one thing down to another. But in other places, it's not useful. And it actually leads to a fallacy known as the reduction fallacy. Okay? The reduction fallacy basically says that we look at things in terms of a nothing but perspective. That A is nothing but B. For example, a museum is nothing but bricks. Right? A violin sonata is nothing but a sequence of vibrating strings. And a human being is nothing but a bunch of chemicals. And that's a bit of a fallacy to assume that, to assume a, a human being is nothing but chemicals. There's no doubt that a human being is chemicals. But it seems like there's something missing from that definition, okay? Because if we are just chemicals, if we're just these chemicals, then we can reduce the human being to a set of ingredients. And you know what? The ingredients for a human is basically the same ingredients as a cat and a chrysanthemum. A chrysanthemum, how do you say that properly? And cucumbers. There's only a slight difference in the formula between a human and a cucumber. So if I asked you to create or cook a human for me, and I gave you the formula, slightly off on that formula, you're getting a cucumber, right? So the reductionist position has a lot of doubt built into it. There's no doubt that as a philosophical position, reductionism has some merit to it. But there's certainly a criticism there, okay? So for example, if we combine hydrogen with oxygen, we get this wetness property that appears, right? But if we combine an unstable element, like sodium, with a toxic to human element, like chlorine, we get salt, okay? Which tastes good, right? We like salt. But that doesn't really explain what's going on there. We've reduced it down to the chemistry, but we're not really looking at the bigger picture there. So when we reduce chemistry down to physics, it's even worse. Physics doesn't necessarily give us what the, what the chemist is trying to do there. Okay? So the resulting knowledge that we get out of reducing something down might not be useful to us. Sure, a physicist can tell you the motion of a molecule. And then he can say, well, that motion of the molecule relates to chemistry. And that chemistry relates to biology and the biology relates to psychology and the psychology relates to economics so that formula I just taught you about the motion of the molecule is why you pay that for your iPod when you go to the store because it's all about physics well no I missed there seemed to be this loss there something was missing in between that okay so the knowledge that we gain from reductionism might be useless to us okay until politics are a branch of science, we shall do well to regard political and social reforms as experiments rather than shortcuts to the millennium. Now we'll look at the opposite position, holism, or something as a whole. So what holism says is, as Douglas Adams wrote, if you try to take apart a cat to see how it works, the first thing you get is a non-working cat. Holism says we should study the whole not the parts. Study things as a whole, okay? What it says is, if you're gonna study human behavior, study the human. Don't worry about the atoms of that human. Study the human as a whole. Similarly, if we're gonna study the market, study the market as a whole. Not all the little individual consumers within that market. Study the market as a whole. So holism looks at it from the opposite perspective to reductionism. For those of you who are taking economics, you know this. It's the difference between macroeconomics and microeconomics. Those are terms that are used within that particular study. Now, here's the question. If we study IB as a whole, or an IB class as a whole, I'm gonna turn the lights on now. You guys are falling asleep. All you guys are falling asleep now in here. Not just one, all. <laughs> all right. Here's the question. If we study IB classes as a whole, not every one of you individually, does an IB class have a personality? It's been maybe a while since you guys have been in classes that weren't IB classes. But if you think back to grade 8, grade 7, you were in there with everybody. Like it, was, it wasn't a specific IB class. Unless, did you go to the middle years program? 
no, because they have middle years IB too. Um, we don't have it in St. James, but they, it is some. But if like we took this class versus some class that's happening somewhere else in the school right now, like say a power mech class or something like that, does the IB class have a different personality if we look at it as a whole? Okay, what, what would be one of the traits of that class? The IB class. What makes that class's personality different? More complex? More logical? Come on, say it. You're smarter. Is that what you want to say out loud? Okay. You're less risky? Less risky? What were you going to say? Okay, so they like to dig, dig deeper, okay. So you would agree that studying IB as a whole might give you answers, might give you knowledge beyond studying it as an individual parts, right? So again, it's the difference between a holistic perspective and a reductionist perspective. All right. Um, again, it's that difference between the whole and the parts, okay. It's in a lot of ways kind of a chicken and egg debate. When you look at something from that perspective, the reductionist perspective, you can gain knowledge by digging deeper, right? But you can also gain knowledge by looking at things from a holistic perspective, okay? And the human sciences tends to do that more, whereas the natural sciences tends to take a more reductionist approach. All right. Now we're going to look at a German position known as the Verstehen position, okay? Verstehen is the German word for understanding, okay? Now what this position is, is a little bit different. So, okay, here's the scenario. Martians land on Earth. They're not attacking, they just land. And they observe a traffic intersection. And they come up with this conclusion. Well, here's what the humans have done. They've set up a Wi-Fi signal in that traffic light that the second it turns red, it sends a Wi-Fi to their cars and it shuts the engine off. And the second that light turns green, it sends a Wi-Fi signal to their cars and the engine re-engages. And that's how it works. Now, they're wrong, but they will try to reduce that perspective down. They're like, wow, these humans are so advanced. I can't find how they're doing this Wi-Fi. Because what the Martians don't understand is that we are obeying a social rule. It's not a physical rule. It's not a mechanical rule. It's a social rule. So their study of physics will not get them the answer. They had to look at it maybe from a holistic perspective to realize, you know what, I bet you this is something the humans themselves are doing. They had to change their perspective to understand the scenario that they were studying, okay? So what the Verstehen position says is, don't bother trying to analyze things in this way. Look at the meaning and the purpose of the situation you're looking at. What is the purpose of this light and what does the light mean? So if you look at it from that perspective, you can gain a different set of knowledge than you would from other perspectives, okay? So it's kind of looking at things from the inside out. Like, what is the meaning of this action, not the action itself, okay? So again, like, let's say you're trying to study a, uh, a tribe in southern Africa, and you're like, why do they wear those fancy headdresses and dance around like that? If you were trying to look at it from a physics perspective, you might not be able to get the answer. But if you try to understand it from the perspective of them as a group, what is the meaning behind this action, maybe then you'll actually get an understanding of what's going on, okay? So that's the Verstehen position, is look at meaning. Was reducing things down, right? So to like from the big picture down to micro and, and analyze things, right? Like that, I, the, the uh, example being study psychology to biology to neuroscience, to chemistry, to physics, right? Is looking at the whole thing, not the parts, and the Verstehen position is looking at meaning, right? Looking at, not really analyzing the whole of it, but just really, what does this mean? And what's its purpose? Yeah. Y yes, because it relates definitely more to social sciences, absolutely, yeah. That's why I'm bringing it up. So, here's an idea, okay? If we look at meaning rather than mechanism, which by the way is not the way that hard sciences work, Right? Hard sciences don't look for meaning. They look for mechanism, right? Like why is this thing, why is this chemistry working the way it is? They look for, they look for mechanism. They don't look for meaning. They don't think, what's the meaning behind this chemical reaction? No, that doesn't affect them. But let's pull it into the human sciences. So we see this guy writing, a writing his name on a piece of paper. What does that mean? 
Okay? He could be writing a check. He could be giving an autograph. He could be taking a test. The reason why he writes his name on the paper is important. The reason is important. Okay? We can't make universal laws like we do in the hard sciences. We can't say, if a person is writing their name, then it means he's writing a check. No. There could be a different reason there, and that's important in the human sciences. Okay? So reason has that meaning. Okay? It helps us make sense of human behavior, whereas mechanical understanding doesn't necessarily understand that. Okay? Um, so, for example, there's a lot of stuff common in all human culture. Gossiping is common. Joking. Sexual interest is common in all cultures. So when we analyze a behavior and we think, what does this mean? We might relate it eventually back to one of these and go, oh, that's what it means. They were gossiping. Or they're just, they just want to date. That's why they did that. Right? That's why they were wearing those fancy clothes and dancing around like that. It, by analyzing meaning, it maybe gives us way more knowledge than looking at the physics behind that particular hat you were wearing. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that physics doesn't give you knowledge. Of course it does. But it's a different knowledge when we're relating it to the human sciences. Okay. Any, how many of you, by the way, study, are studying economics? Just, just you? Okay. Uh, you talked about Adam Smith at all? <laughs> okay. Adam Smith had an interesting position. He talks about this invisible hand perspective. And what he says is that, that even though we're individuals, we tend to often do things with a group mentality even though we don't know it. And it's this invisible hand that tends to push things along. Now, this is in the realm of economics. He would say that um, an entrepreneur who wants a lot of profit might end up in resulting in us getting cheaper goods and services at a, higher, at a, at a lower cost, right? So he's saying that sometimes when we do things, it actually lends to a greater good in, in things like economic societies, and that this relates to unintended consequences. So there's no doubt that when we do something, there's a consequence to our behavior. But sometimes that consequence was nothing we intended. What Adam Smith would promote is in the realm of economics, that unintended consequence is sometimes very, very positive, that economies tend to drive themselves to the better good. But there's a different way to look at this, perhaps, as well. Okay? That consequence might actually shape behavior. Okay? It could be. Yeah, it could be thought of that way. And, and part of that is, is bias. So let me, let me just sort of bring this bias perspective. Maybe that will answer your question. So there's no doubt that we have bias. There's no way to avoid our biases, right? We can be aware of them. That's at least one way. But if we begin with prejudices, okay, we are more likely to have bias and prejudice about humans than about natural science things. We're not necessarily prejudiced like this chemical. I don't like the look of that chemical. I always like this one. This one's better. No. We tend to not have those types of things, which gives the natural sciences a maybe another advantage over human sciences. Okay? So that means we're a little more open-minded as well in that area. Okay? All right. So... A good antidote for bias, if you're working in the natural sciences, is for natural scientists to tend to eliminate the biases by setting up experiments that reduce it down to the one variable that you're studying. But as we've seen in other things we've done in this unit, in the human sciences, that's really, really hard. Okay? The other thing that science does is it uses uh, techniques like peer review which tend to criticize people's work until the more accurate work tends to bubble to the top of the pile saying, well, this is the more true scientific study. And these ones down here are less true because they've been criticized so highly. And you know what? The human sciences does that too, right? That also works in the human sciences. We just don't see it as much as we do in the natural sciences. Okay. I'm going to go lights off again. I think I've woken you guys up. I know you're all watching the clock, but we're almost there. Okay, so finally, one would, might argue that the whole point of science is to make accurate predictions. That the reason we study weather is so that we can predict the weather. The reason we study earthquakes is so we can predict earthquakes, etc. So how do predictions go in the human sciences? Well, they don't go that well, generally. Okay, 
And I'm going to present three reasons why I would propose they don't go well. One, it's really complex to set up experiments and try to come up with experiments that work in the, in the human sciences. You've seen two of them. You saw the experiment with the, the, the shocker, and you saw the teacher who ran the experiment with her students. They were good experiments, but they weren't necessarily perfect. There was some criticism that you could put on them. Second reason would be um, that what you actually are predicting in the human sciences might not, not even be valuable, and what you predict might actually change the behavior. I was talking about this earlier. So for example, economists might predict that we're going to about to go into a recession. Okay? And they could predict, you know what, we're going to have massive unemployment in Canada. Well, you know what? That prediction might actually make people actually try to avoid that, and therefore we might not have that. I mean, it's classic. Have you ever predicted before a football game that, oh, that guy's going to blow the game? And the guy actually plays better to avoid that from happening, right? So sometimes that can, the prediction in the human sciences can actually affect the behavior that you're actually trying to predict. And then finally, that the Verstehen position might argue that we don't use human sciences to do predictions. We do human sciences to describe and understand behaviors that are already existing. That it's not the point of human sciences to make predictions. That's something you do in the natural sciences. Okay? Finally, I would say that maybe the human sciences is just waiting for that one great scientist to come along. The so-called Einstein of the human sciences hasn't come along yet. We've had like Newton and Einstein in the, in the hard sciences, but that person hasn't come along yet. Maybe it's one of the five of you is the human scientist revolutionary person that we haven't hit yet. Okay? So let's look at the problems of human sciences. In the realm of observation, we cannot observe other people's minds. So that's a problem. Questionnaires that we cr put peop to people might be misleading or biased. Observing people might actually affect the way they behave. Okay, what about measurement? Well, some things are hard to put a number to in the social sciences, right? Like how many thoughts have you had today? I, I can't put a number on that. Hypothesis. Well, as I said just now, the act of prediction might affect the behavior of what you're predicting. Experimentation. Oh man, it's so hard to run experiments with humans. We have ethics to worry about with humans. We don't have to worry about ethics and geology, but like you were just saying, we got to worry about ethics and morality. Oh, wow. You mean I can't take those two twins and separate them at birth just to see how things turn out for them? And one of them is going to live in a pit with wolves? No, I, you know, you're not allowed to do that. And then laws. Well, we can make laws in like the laws of thermodynamics, but make the law of human behavior doesn't really fit doesn't fit into the human sciences. So although we consider these five things a fundamental part of the word science, and I don't disagree that they are, when we start applying them to humans, we have tons of problems, okay? That what, that's what makes the human sciences maybe held in a lower regard in terms of science than the natural sciences, but it doesn't dismiss its importance. Because there's big questions that come out of the human sciences huge questions. How are our minds related to our bodies? Could a machine ever actually think? Do you even have free will? And could you exist as a brain in a vat? Is that even possible? Could you exist without the brain and without the vat? Could you exist as pure energy? Those are big questions. Big questions that maybe we need answers to. Or maybe we search for answers to. All right. And kids, that's it for me. I know you guys have been struggling through the period today. It seems like it's been a very...